Today is a great day. You know why? Because today you are going to become a Linux user, an Arch Linux user. You will be able to wear this shirt with pride. So join me. Let's get started. So this is for people who've never used Linux before. We're going to use VirtualBox within Windows, but if you're on a Mac, it will work probably about the same. Now, instead of starting out with Ubuntu or Mint or one of those other user-friendly distributions, we're gonna start out with Arch Linux, which is supposedly one of the hardest distributions. But I'm going to show you how easy it is to install. Now, once you get it installed, there's gonna be some problems as you're going through, but those problems will teach you how to use Linux. So if you really wanna learn Linux and you wanna be really good at it, this is the path to take. So we're going to install Arch Linux. All right, so we're here on the Arch Linux downloads page. This is archlinux.org slash download. And we've got some release info here, um, the ISO size, typical stuff. Now this is a little bit confusing because you don't just go to a page with a big giant green download button like some Linux distributions, but that's okay. It shows that you can install it in Vagrant, Docker, all these different ways. What you wanna look for is the HTTP direct downloads. And you'll find the download that's in your area, you know, somewhere that's close to you. As you can see, we've got worldwide mirrors here. So I will scroll down to the United States where I'm located. It's hosted in a lot of countries and I'll just grab the top one here. Now here's a few different ISO. Uh, there's an ISO signature torrent, all of these different things. What I'm going to do is just download this ISO right here. And this is what we're going to start out with. And I'm going to save this as Arch Linux ISO. And I will cut the video in certain places so that you don't have to sit through downloads and compiling and things like that. Okay, so we're done. The ISO is downloaded. If you don't know what an ISO is, that's fine. It's a image that used to be used for CD-ROMs back when we burned um, things onto CD-ROMs with ISOs. That's how we install operating systems for years and years and years. However, uh, we kept the format and ditched the CD-ROM drives. So now I have the Arch Linux ISO. Now what we're going to do is use VirtualBox to run that ISO. Now VirtualBox is available here, virtualbox.org. And since I already have it installed, I can't really cover the install process, but it's pretty simple. Just kind of click, 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 go through the install. Actually, I think I made a YouTube video on it a while back. You might wanna check. But we're going to use VirtualBox to load up this ISO. Now I already have a ton of machines here in my VirtualBox, but I'm going to add another one. So here I'll click on the new button. And it says name an operating system. Okay. We're going to name this Arch Linux Trial. Now for here, I use a different drive for my virtual boxes, but you can just probably install it onto your C drive and it'll be fine. Okay, and our type and version have been selected for us already. It says Arch Linux. So we'll just go ahead and click next. Now here we have the memory size. This entirely depends on your machine and your system, how much memory you want to use. I would recommend about half of what you're using, unless you're like me and you have 64 gigs, um, which is just crazy. I'm just gonna go ahead and put in eight gig for now. And I'll click next. And next it's asking for a virtual hard disk, which again is uh, how much hard drive space do you have? This is the reason why I use a different disk for a virtual box. Um, for Arch Linux, I would say probably 20 gig is fine. For this part, I use VirtualBox disk image. And I like them to be dynamically allocated. It's not quite as fast as a fixed size, but if you set all of your virtual boxes to fixed sizes, you can take up a lot of hard drive space. Okay, and here I'm going to change this to 20 gig. And we'll click create. 
Okay, so now I have my machine created. Um, there isn't a whole lot you need to do here. I like to go into the settings. And sometimes like doing the install especially just kind of boost up the CPUs a little bit. We'll give this 10 CPUs in this case. And for network, you'll want to switch that to a bridged adapter. Um, that way it bridges it, makes it connect to your standard internet connection so that you have an internet connection while you're doing this. So we'll click OK. Now in here we have to click on Settings, Storage, and right there where it says IDE Controller, this is a fake CD-ROM drive. So we'll need to choose a virtual optical disk, and this was Arch Linux, the latest one as of this video. And then we'll just click OK. And now we can start this up. Okay, now we have an Arch Linux install, medium, medium with speech, boot existing OS, run memtest, which basically tests your RAM, um, not a really big deal on a virtual machine, some hardware information. What we're going to do is go to Arch Linux install medium. And it's going to run through a bunch of this stuff on startup. Okay, now we're here at a prompt. So this can be a little scary if you've never used Linux before. You're like, what is this? So it automatically logs you in as root. This is a um, kind of a fake virtual environment on the CD-ROM. And as you can see, to install Arch Linux, follow the installation guide, which is what we're going to follow to do this. For Wi-Fi, authenticate to the wireless network using IWCTL. We don't need to do that because we have a, a bridged connection. After connecting to the internet, the installation guide can be accessed via the convenience script installation guide, which is cool. So I will go ahead and load up the installation guide and we'll look at our first step after this. Okay, so here's our installation guide. What I will do is I will put this over to one side and I'll put our Arch Linux window on the other side. That way we can just go side by side and I'm just gonna follow this installation guide to a T. And we did the pre-installation part. Visit the download page. Um, you can verify the signature if you want. I didn't do that. I don't really care that much. Um, however, if you're installing this on a real machine, you would want to do that. But for this case, it doesn't really matter. Prepare an installation medium. We've already done that. Okay, now we're here to boot the live environment, which is where we're at now. We're here at step three. We're logged into the virtual console as a root user. Um, we have our ZSH shell prompt. So we're ready to go. We don't need to switch to a different console, but it shows how to do that here. The first thing we want to do is set the keyboard layout. And it says LS, US rare, so we'll do that and we'll, uh, we'll see what we have available here. D, key maps. Okay, we've got a ton of them. Now here, this is where things get confusing because in the instructions, it says just to do this LS and then to modify the layout, just pick one of those. Um, but obviously there's a whole list of layouts. People may not know what their layout is. Now you'll wanna pick one of those if you have a different key map other than the default US key map, which is what we have. Okay, now it says to verify the boot mode. To verify the boot mode, list the EFI vars directory. So we'll just type in exactly what they have listed here. Cannot access it. That's kind of odd. So let's read the instructions. If the command shows the directory without error, then the system is booted in UEFI mode. If the directory does not exist, the system may be booted in BIOS or CSM mode, which is how we're going to boot our virtual machine. So let's connect it to the internet. It says ensure your network interface is listed and enabled. So we'll type in IP link. And it would appear that I have uh, two ethernet connections here the LO and the ENP0S3. 
connect to the network. So with Ethernet, plug in the cable. Or with Wi-Fi, connect to the wireless network. Those here for DHCP, that's where it gets your IP address automatically. Um, it should be provided by network D and should work out of the box. So let's try it. We'll try to ping archlinux.org. And we're so lucky. It works. So hit control C for that. Now it says update the system clock. So this is gonna set it to network time. As a warning, if you do this on a regular, uh, good old fashioned laptop or machine and you have windows on there, this can mess it up. But for our virtual machine, this is fine. Time date CTL, set NTP equal to true. Oh, set NTP true. So as you can see, I'm typing it in exactly as it says to. Okay, let's check the status. We'll do time date CTL status. All right, cool. There's our local time, coordinated universal time, etc. Okay. Now, when recognized by the live system, disks are inside a block device such as DevSDA, NVMe01, etc. So let's type in fdisk-l like it says to do here on the screen. And there's my virtual box hard disk. That's located at slash dev slash SDA. So that's basically like a regular hard drive on a laptop or a computer if it's not an NVMe. Um, and then here we've got a loopback device. We can kind of ignore that for now. Oh, and it says right there in the directions, results ending in ROM, loop, or air root may be ignored. So the following partitions are required for a chosen device. One partition for the root directory, or if you're booting in UEFI mode, which we're not, you'll have an EFI system partition. We don't have to worry about that. All we really need is a root partition. Now here's an example layout. So you can create, here are your options. You can create a swap partition and a root partition. Or if you wanna use it with GPT, which we're not doing today, we don't have to worry about it. So we can use fdisk or parted to modify partition tables. So what I'm going to do is use cfdisk, which is fdisk with a little bit of a GUI. Okay, so we have GPT, DOS, SGI, we will select DOS for our label type. As you can see here, we have our free space that's on the hard drive. We've got 20 gig of free space. So what we want to do is create a swap drive. I'm going to create a swap drive that's about one gig. So that leaves us 19 gig for the system drive. So let's go ahead and create a new drive. Partition size, we'll make this 19 gig because we know that we're going to use one gig for the swap. We want to select primary here. And there we go, we have a primary Linux partition type. Now, we need to go down to the free space again, select new again, and as you can see it says 1023 meg, that's the remaining space on the disk. And that's what we're going to use for our swap. So we'll press enter, we'll select primary, now for here, it says partition type Linux. We want to change that partition type to swap. So arrow over here to type. And there it says 82, which is Linux swap. Now the swap drive is just basically a drive that uh, when you fill up your memory, it jumps onto that drive and it uses that hard drive as memory. Usually when you're in a swap situation, you're in deep trouble anyway because you've filled up all your memory. Um, but I usually don't make these very big, especially for virtual machines. It's just not that important. Now we'll go over here and select write. Are you sure you want to write? We'll type in yes. And now I can quit the program. Okay, so now we have our partitions created. We'll go to the next step here that says format the partitions. 
And we're just going to type it in exactly as they say. MKFS dot EXT four dev SDA one, which as we can see up in the CF disk, that is our main 19 gig partition. All right, we're good. Okay, now we're gonna make our swap file, MK swap, you guessed it, dev SDA two for our other file. So now we've got these two steps here. Now we wanna mount the root volume to slash MNT. So if the root volume is say dev SDA, mount dev SDA to slash mount. So we'll do that. Mount dev SDA one to slash MNT. This is the time to go out and get one of your favorite beverages in the Linux world. They often say, go grab a beer or go grab a soda or tea. We've got ice water here. You could just grab some ice water with a little lemon in it if you wanted to do it in the Jeremy Morgan spirit. Okay, and it looks like we're done. Um, we used 62% of the CPU to do that, which is kind of amazing, but it actually went pretty fast. So you can use Packstrap to install additional packages. We're not really gonna do that right now. So we need to generate an fstab file. We're going to create a symbolic link here. ln slash f. And so this thing, they probably should add this to the directions and maybe, maybe they do. Let's click on a new tab here. Probably isn't like super clear how to find your time zone. But I'll show you how to do that. We're going to type in ls user share zone info. And here you can see all the different regions. Now I'm in Portland, so I'm going to be in the Los Angeles region. I already know that, but I'm going to have to find it on here. So let's look at, say, uh, US. Actually, I do see some time zones here. Let's see, PST, there we go. That's where I'm supposed to be. PST, which is Pacific Standard Time, eight, which is probably eight hours from UTC, which is where we're located, and PDT, Pacific Daylight Time. Let's check that out. Uh, yeah, I don't really like that. I, I know what time zone I'm supposed to be. I don't remember where I chose it from here. So there we go. So I'm going to do US, then Pacific. And that's going to be my time zone. So now I can do LN dash SF. And then this matches this uh, region, city, et cetera, over here. And you can also do slash tab to see if there are any more. We'll, but we'll pipe this to Etsy local time. And it says run hardware clock to generate this. Let's just run it. I'm actually not sure what this does. I don't know. It said to run it, so I ran it. Oh, I see. This assumes a hardware clock set to UTC, which it's not, but I guess it is now. So now we need to open locale.gen. Now for this, we'll use Vi. Um, actually, let's see if Nano's in here. Nano is a little bit easier for... Oh, Nano is not here. So I guess we will have to use Vi. So we'll type in VI. Oh, sorry. We need to, I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit. We need to type in locale-gen. That's locale with an E, Jeremy. There we go. Generate locales. Okay. So now we need to VI, see, locale, 
comp. I don't see the file. Ah, Vizma. Okay. So how are we going to edit this file? Okay, password update was successful. So, choose and install a Linux-capable bootloader. But it doesn't really give you any information here. You know, as I'm looking through this, it doesn't say where to get that. But we have a link to click. So we'll click it. Here are the different bootloaders. I, I think we want to reuse Grub for this. So let's just, uh, we'll do grub for our installation. So pacman s grub. Proceed with installation, yes. Okay. Now you can see it says grub install target i386. Mm, yeah, we'll just do that. We'll do exactly as the instructions say this time. Target equals i386 dash pc dev sda all right no error reported cool so now we've installed grub with a grub install command so that should come up just fine there's a bunch of stuff here for efi stuff and crazy bootloaders for that you don't need to really worry about it right now we want to scroll down to making our configuration file. So we'll do grub dash mk config dash o boot grub. It would be helpful if I could type today grub config. All right. So that gives us a grub config. RAID and encryption. We don't care about any of that stuff. Or EFI or chain loaders. Just trying to find the things that are important for you. So making sure. So I think we're pretty good. So now we go back to our installation guide. We can exit groot. Optionally, we can unmount all the partitions. So we'll do that. Dash R slash MNT. Yeah. Okay. Now we'll type in reboot. And we'll reboot and see if our new Linux system boots. Okay, now one thing is, it's trying to uh, jump into the Arch Linux installer again. So, we'll go to power off. And go to settings. And for storage, we can click on this Arch Linux installer. And we'll remove it from our virtual drive. Now that doesn't delete the image completely, it just removes it from the drive. So this will be our final test to see if it boots. And it looks like we have Arch Linux and advanced options. And there's my login. So here I will type in root. My password is password because security is important. And there we go. Okay, now here I have a full Linux system. This is the Arch Linux system that we've just put together. Once again, you're staring at a prompt. So I will put up a link of different uh, window managers. So you'll need to install a window manager and a desktop. Personally, I like LXDE. LXDE isn't updated a whole lot and it's kind of old. You probably want something like GNOME or KDE or one of the more popular ones. I will cover how to install those in a future episode. Okay, so I have an up and running Arch Linux system. And what we did is follow the instructions 
notice I had to deviate from the instructions a couple times based on things that I've known in the past. Those are things that you're going to have to Google unless you watch this video, of course. But my point is with Arch Linux is the struggle is what teaches you. So, so in future videos, we will dial in this uh, VirtualBox Linux installation a little bit more. But for now, this is what it's like to go through the instructions to set it up. So installing Arch isn't really all that terrible. Okay, so I hope that wasn't too painful. If you have any problems with this installation, feel free to leave a comment. Or you can yell at me on Twitter, here. If you like this video and you want to see more videos like it, subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching.